Hi, welcome everyone. And uh, really pleased today to have a special guest on the program, Mr. John Smybert. Uh, John is the founder of Sales Mastermind Asia Pacific. Uh, John's got a long sales history in, in enterprise sales, big tech, sales management, general management. Uh, for some time now, he's been a, a pretty sought after speaker. He's an author, consultant, a trainer. Um, he's got a huge amount of content and a huge, fantastic quality content out there on YouTube and, um, and, and other places. Uh, he's the head of the Sales Leadership Forum and also the Strategic Selling Group. So amazing uh, sales credentials. So John, welcome to the program. Absolute delight to be here, Stephen. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk with you. It's great to talk to you always, John, and uh, really looking forward to this. So, so John, let, let, let's start off um, with something you talk about, the, the different types of selling that, that organizations undertake. And uh, we, can, we can go from there. I want to get into disruptive selling and some other topics, but let's start with the different types of selling happening. I think I'd like to start by saying, for me, uh, the really great salespeople have the right mindset. And what does that mean? It all means all sorts of things. They need, you know, need the right mindset to engage properly with people and not be fearful of engaging and so on. But they also need the right mindset around the customer and why they're selling. And mm -hmm. in my mind, they're selling to create value for the customer. They're selling to help the customer achieve outcomes the customer really wants to achieve. Uh, okay. And reciprocity needs to be managed, but reciprocity should take care of their needs. And so with that in mind, I, I pressure this all the time because I see the behavior of salespeople are so focused on, I've got to get in there and get an order and all the questions are around you know, qualification and making sure they're yes. timing everything to get the order by the end of the quarter and so on. And a customer just sees through that and says, this guy's not for me not here for me. This girl is, is manipulating me or trying to get me to do something yes. within a time frame or whatever I'm, I'm not ready to do. And so there's no trust. Yeah. We must be there for the customer. And with that in mind, I reckon there's three types of selling. Uh, and the first, first type of selling that I talk to, I, I label product selling. And people talk about feature function benefits selling. That's an old, product sales model okay and yes you might ask a few questions say i've got a great product that will meet your needs as a result of the questions that i've asked look here's the features here's the function here's the benefits and you know some of those benefits might stick but the, the fact is you're talking about your product right <laughs> here's a challenge i'll put out to 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 everybody out there that's selling mm. the first meeting you have with a customer and i'm talking b2b sales here the first meeting you have with a customer, don't discuss your company or your product. It's a good challenge. Now, it's a good that's challenge. a major challenge for a lot of salespeople. Yes. But it's a good challenge. Why? Because if you have the right mindset, you're talking with the customer about their business and getting to understand their business and, again, and also getting the customer through a bit of a thinking journey. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Yep. And none of, none of that's about your product. <laughs> the biggest trap I see salespeople falling into, yes, they learn how to, to ask questions and, and bring insight through the questions. And then the, they'll ask a question and the customer will say, oh, yes, we have that challenge. We, you know, we're, really, we're really struggling with that. Ah, let me tell you how our product addresses right. that. So they may be and able to resist in the early the part. opportunity to help the yeah. customer. Yeah. So, so yeah, that, that they may ha go in with the right mindset and try and look at it from the customer's point of view. As soon as the customer puts up something they can solve, they jump into the solution and start talking about, we start talking about ourselves. Oh. And it's so sad. It's so sad. Customers don't want that. Customers want to be yep. helped. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of customers have never experienced or very seldom experienced a salesperson that helps them. And therefore, mm -hmm. Yeah, the barriers are up, they don't trust and so on. When they do get a salesperson that's, that's there to help them, they're there to take them through uh, a thinking journey and, and really yep. think about their business without trying to sell feature, function, benefit or product, uh, the, the sky opens for them. It's a wonderful experience. And that's how we need to sell. Mm. So back, back to the three types of selling I talked about. Yep. Product selling, it tends to be all about the product. You're talking with people that, 
that have expressed an issue or challenge and have identified the fact that they need a product and they're asking you to come in and talk about the product. Uh, so you're typically, typically responding to customer specifications. Uh, the information flow tends to be all customer information flow uh, and they're driving that discussion. And the value focus tends to be drawn down under price. So mm. when you're in a product sale, at the time you, you, you start discussing price uh, or value, the customer's mind is on price. They're thinking commodity and they're going to compare you against others and so on. You haven't created value for them in the, in the conversation and so the whole mindset is on price. Uh, to me, if a salesperson gets that price question halfway through the selling process or even towards the end and the focus is on price, they have not done a good job of selling. Right. They have not helped the customer. So that's the first type of selling. Yeah. Uh, but so many sales organizations drive their salespeople this way, though, don't they? They're, they're feeding them with lots of product training, features, functions, benefits, um, and then you know, they're, they're driving their, their sales metrics and everything based around pushing customers in the top and pushing them through and, you know, creating pipe and, um, you it, know, it's, Stephen, you're it's absolutely great. Yeah. It's crazy, but, but it, it's true. And, and, and some of the things I'd speak to our senior executives about is cut down on your products, uh, product training. Yep. And, and, and lift up, you know, how do we sell? How do we engage? How do we grow our EQ to engage more effectively with customers, et cetera? Uh, and let's focus on customer outcomes, not our product. Yeah, couldn't agree more. We, we, they should be just drastically reducing product training. Um, I've, 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 seen, I've seen customers hire people out of an industry. You know, they're, they're selling uh, some sort of engineering-based product or engineered product and they hire an engineer out of a customer and bring them in, we're gonna make this person into a salesperson. I've seen those guys, without any product knowledge whatsoever, become extremely successful. And often when we train them to the nth degree on the, pro on the product, their success level lowers. Mm, because I'm not they surprised. start thinking product and not customer outcomes. Yeah, John, I, I heard someone the other day say, we shouldn't call product managers product managers. They should be problem solving managers and they should be training the salespeople on how to solve customer problems. Yeah, well, let, let me, let me uh, get through the three awesome. areas and maybe <laughs> we, we won't even call them that. Well, uh, yeah, we, you're really saying let's call them solution managers or whatever. Uh, yeah. Let's get through to what I call disruptive selling and, and we'll talk about that. So the second area that uh, I, I see in sales is solution selling. There's absolutely nothing wrong with solution selling. I'm not going to decry solution selling. Uh, however, I'm going to talk about disruptive selling and, and if you can get into an environment where you're doing disruptive selling, and, and I don't mean disruptive from a negative point of view. Uh, the fact is, Customers want their thinking disruptive, and as, as salespeople, we need to understand that and help them rethink the way yeah. they're running their business. And that's okay. what I mean by disruptive selling. Solution yes. selling is very much, hey, Mr. Customer, uh, what, what, are the, what are the issues and challenges and problems you've got? Uh, and let's talk about that. And, and so the type of dialogues around exploring needs and challenges, the salesperson orientation is on customer solution. Um, uh, the customer interface is typically with a coach or an advocate in there. The dialogue is still pretty much driven, driven by the customer. They've identified we've got this challenge. Can yes. you help us with it, Mr. Supplier? Um, and, and it's you know, often driven by an RFP. Uh, and the value focus of the, the salesperson tends to be around differentiated value. Okay, so that's right. solution selling. And I, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but, but wherever possible, what happens with solution selling is we tend, the customer tends not, want, not to want to speak to us until they've already identified and framed mm. their problem and understand the sort of problem they've got and probably put some thought into what the solution might look like. Now we're going to talk to people that could provide that sort of solution. Right? Mm. So it, it tends to be later in the buying journey, not too late, but later in the buying journey than I think salespeople need to be. Uh, so let's talk about disruptive selling. Um, yes. And in this uh, in disruptive selling, that the type of dialogue you're having is a teaching and challenging dialogue. 
uh, it, it's a dialogue where you're helping the customer think about a different way of, of addressing their business challenges and issues and opportunities. And I like to talk opportunities as much as I like to talk about challenges or issues that we're trying to face. The salesperson orientation is a change agent. Okay, that they're in there to help the customer think through, drive change and think through yep. change. The customer interface is with a strategic change leader in the organization. And who's that likely to be? The business owner. <laughs> business owner, CEO, yep. you know, a senior executive who is yep. looking to drive change in that organization. So if you're not having a dialogue at that level, you can't run a disruptive selling or you mm. drop back into solution selling where middle level managements are, try, uh, uh, are given the job of trying to solve challenges. A problem that's already identified, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, when does the dialogue start? Very early in the, the buying journey. Um, when the customer's learning, uh, at the time the status quo is yep. being upset. And, it, and a really good disruptive salesperson actually goes and and upsets the status quo, gets the customer thinking, oh, we do have an opportunity or we do have a challenge we hadn't thought about. And disrupted selling, uh, there's a, a very good quote by a, a friend of mine, uh, uh, Paul Watts, and he said, disruption occurs when someone identifies a problem we didn't know we had and provides mm. a solution we didn't know we needed. Think about that. So wow. we're in very early, we actually show them they've got a problem they haven't got. They didn't know they had. Or they have an opportunity they didn't know they had. Mm. And then we provide a solution at the end, in the end of the day that, uh, that um, they didn't know they needed. Uh, that's yeah. disruptive selling. Yeah. So what are the other differences between solution and disruptive? Is it, so so we're, we're getting in earlier. We're talking at a more strategic level. Um, how well, else? We're much better aligning with their buying process, their buying journey, uh, yep. because we're there right at the beginning and we're working with them as it goes through. Uh, the other thing is, is game changer value. Um, when I've seen disruptive selling done very, very well, there's no question about price at all. Mm. They see this massive value that you're driving or going to help them achieve. Uh, they are just able to discern that value and, and assuming your price is only a small fraction of that value, price is not a question at all. Right. Um, I, I, and, and, the, and the other thing is the whole thinking is around outcome, not the product or solution. Mm. I, I've got a story on that if you're interested. Oh, in. I'd, I'd lo love to hear an example. Yeah, for sure. Please. Uh, this, this goes back a while and the world's changed a little bit, but, but the, the same thing applies. I was selling back in the 80s, selling manufacturing solutions, software solutions uh, on proprietary hardware for um, NCR, as it turns out, in, back in those days. Uh, and I was selling uh, one, one instance to a um, manufacturer of light fittings. Uh, and I, was, I had become a domain expert. The other thing about disruptive selling, you must be an expert in some area of the customer's domain. But I've yeah. become a domain expert in manufacturing. I could go in and talk to the manufacturing manager, wander around the factory, look at all the queues and what was happening at all the workstations and so on, ask very intelligent questions and, and bring insight through those questions. Yep just because I understood manufacturing extremely well and different ways in which it can be approached. So I went in here and in there and had those sort of discussions with the manufacturing manager, the chief financial officer and, and so on and so forth. They got widely excited about, hey, we can change our business, we can reduce yep. the lead time to market, with all sorts of different value they could see in this. Uh, and they, 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 I ended up no competitor at all. Um, and one day they said, all right, well, you know, we've got a proposal, we, we better go and have a look at this software. Can you give us a demonstration? By the way, to everybody out there selling software, never do a demonstration. A lot of people say, what? Demonstrations kill your sale if you're driving a disruptive selling process because mm. you drop the, the, the thinking back down to feature function benefit and you lose sight of the real outcomes you're trying to drive at a business level. Mm. And secondly, they start pointing at little features and say, I don't understand why that feature does it that way, right? And it really doesn't matter. So, no, yeah, no, no, I, I agree. In this case, yep. Yeah, yeah. In this case, we brought them in for a demonstration, put up two screens, 
and then started whiteboarding closed loop manufacturing and how you could change the way in which you, you manufacture, having great dialogue. They brought their CEO in. I'd met the CEO briefly, but this was the first real exposure he had had to what we were talking about. So we talk about a different system in the way they can manage their operation to, to achieve some outstanding outcomes that they were looking for in mm. changing their position in the marketplace. An hour and a half into this presentation, it was supposed to go an hour, the CEO said, hey, I've seen enough, I've got to go, thank you very much, that was wonderful. And they said, let's go guys, and they were walking out, and one of the, one of the geeky guys in there said, whoa, hang on a sec, I haven't seen the software yet. <laughs> and the CEO thought for a second, oh no, I've seen enough, and he left. Mm. I was out in the factory, we got the order, we're out in the factory, uh, or out in the, in the building, uh, walking around with the CFO, who was identifying where we were gonna put the computer. Back in those days, we needed a computer with air conditioning and all that sort of stuff to run this on. Cloud doesn't exist. And by the way, we were selling computers with big margins. Our proprietary computer software was where the small margin was. So it's a computer we were really selling. The CEO walked past as we were looking around this room. He said, oh, good to see you here, John. What are you doing here? And he said, oh, we're, look, we're working out where we're going to put the computer. And he looked at me, <laughs> at me with a blank look on his face and he said, does a computer come with this? <laughs> he had signed a million dollar plus order wow. for a computer and software. And it didn't even occur to him that a computer came with it. He just knew they were going to drive changes, the outcomes in the business. Right. That's the message. You're not selling a product, you're selling an outcome. And that's where the focus needs to be. Right, right. All right. So, so the very different sort of sale process than, you know, the old product sale or the solution sale, not even old, like this has been around for a while, John, it's not new. Everybody talks about the evolution, yeah. evolution of sales going from product selling to solution selling to challenger selling or whatever they want to call it. I call it yeah. disruptive selling. Uh, the, the reality is all three types of selling have been around for over a hundred years. Sure. So it's just, we got to get our mindset right. We have to get the education right, our skills right. We have to be a domain expert to be able to see, speak with senior executives you know, in the customer's domain and ask, you know, ask questions, bring insight to the table, tell stories like the story I just told, stories with an outcome that really helps the yes. customer through a thinking journey. Mm. And, and it's learning how to do that discovery, getting down deep in the hole and understanding the business to the nth degree and asking lots of insightful questions to, to the, where they realize this person really understands our business quite well. Yes. Uh, and when you're to that point, then taking them through a thinking journey with lots of what if uh, questions, what if it, you did it differently in this way or what it, uh, and also stories to say, ah, oh, I saw another uh, organization that did it this way. Would that work for you? And you start taking them on a thinking journey to a new way of thinking, which you can then deliver to in a very differentiated way. Yeah. Great margins, good game change of value for the customer and for yourself. Mm. So, so John, if, if I'm a, if sales leaders listening and, and thinking about, okay, he's got to get his team more onto this, you know, disruptive type of selling. You know, how, how do you go about that? How do you go about getting your team on? Well, there, there, might, there might be one or two folks in the team who do it naturally, but how do we get the bulk of the team going? And is there a structure they can sort of hang on to? There, there is a structure and, and let's talk about that. But I just want to make a point. It is really tough, no matter how good a salesperson is, to be able to run a disruptive sales strategy without the corporation supporting them in that mm. and, and okay. providing the sort of content and information and processes they need to be able to run a positively disruptive sales process. Yeah, agree. Um, yeah. Uh, let's talk about the five areas I think we need to really think about as an organization. Uh, and salespeople can listen to this and, and probably learn from this and do some, uh, some uh, things that will help them be more disruptive in the way they sell. Yeah. Um, but the first thing is, we're ahead of time, we, we, we need to look at our target markets and specific targets, really understand what the stakeholders care about. What, is the, what are the real issues and challenges and opportunities and what outcomes are they looking for? And this takes a lot of study and research. And it's not one sales, but it's talking at a whole industry. If you're selling to a, a 
financial industry, for example, or in, in yeah. one sector of the financial industry, you need to really research that, understand what they care about mm -hmm. and need to put stakeholder maps together and think about that for that industry. And once you've done that, you need to think about the triggers that are likely to upset the status quo in those organisations. You know, I hear people talking about trigger-based selling all the time. Let's, yeah. let's look for the triggers and when the triggers come up, we'll race in there and we'll start selling. Well, the fact is you need ahead of time to identify what triggers could occur okay. and if they did, what would that mean? What sort of strategic disruption would it cause? What sort of competitive disruption? Uh, what sort of customer-led disruption and market disruption, et cetera? What legislative, legislative change? And yep. What impact would that have on the customer? So that ahead of time, we can think about how can we take advantage of that? How can we help the customer respond to that trigger in a very positive and constructive way by disrupting their thinking? So, and the third area then, once you've done that, the third area there is how, how can they counter? Uh, we, we need to identify what the customer could do and certainly things that we could help them do, but the focus has got to be on the customer. What can they do? Mm. And then what content do we need to help them think about it? Now, I, I'm a great believer that the sort of content, sales content I'm talking about, has no mention of our product or mm. company in it at all. It's all about the customer when they get this particular trigger or issue or challenge happening in the market. These are sort of things that customers have done or companies have done. And these are the challenges they face and how they overcame mm. those challenges. And here's the outcomes they dropped. Not one bit about your product. The fact that you've published it, obviously you can help them with it. I'll make that assumption. You don't have to push your product in your content. Get your product out of your content. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, and so, then the sorry, yeah, can I go on, John? So, yeah, it, it really is does take a, almost a company wide approach um, to do this yeah. really well. Uh, the, the four, there's five areas in this. Yeah. So, the, the, the fourth area is, is making sure we have the approach narratives. Mm. Now, once we really understand what they care about, we can then get, uh, go in with, you know, with, with an approach that says we'd like to talk to you. Uh, with you about what they care about. Sure. Uh, 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 and by the way, it's as simple as that. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's got nothing to do with product. It's got nothing to do with you know, features and function. And that. We want to talk to you about something you care about. Mm. Uh, and yes. if you're doing that at an executive level and are saying, look, we've got some thinking that we can bring to the table that really might help you start disruptively thinking about the way you can change your business that's better in this yep. area that you care about, that's probably enough for most CEOs to actually say, okay, I, I'd mm. like to hear about that. Uh, and then once you're in there, you need to make sure there's clarity around the thinking journey you're going to take the customer through. Okay. Does that make sense? The yes. strategic paths and options that you're going to take them through and the sort of questions you're going to ask. Now, I, I, I don't like scripting at all. I don't like prescribing questions because the really good salespeople have to be in the moment with the customer. They have to be there mm. engaged uh, with good EQ and, 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 and not saying, oh, what question am I going to ask next? It's, it actually comes naturally to them off the top of the head. But, but you need to understand what those thinking journeys are likely to be and make sure you've got the, the, the sort of questions and content and paths to follow and make sure the salespeople are trained on those. So all those five areas, what mm. the stakeholders care about, the triggers, how yeah. the customer can counter a trigger or leverage a trigger, uh, what the, our approach narratives are and what our thinking journey is going to be when we're in there talking mm. to the customer are all things we need to plan and manage and think about and then tr and then develop content for and then train our salespeople and send them out starting to implement that as a program. Oh, that's good. So you've got the five steps there. That's awesome. W one step I I'd just like to dig into a little bit, John, is that last one. You know, that, that, that thinking journey, if you like, that's sort of like a discovery type of process. And uh, I know you've got some thoughts on, on how to go about that and, and, and how we lead the customer or a sequence, you know, we go through to lead a customer through that. Yeah, um, it's, that's an area that's, uh, that a lot of salespeople need a lot of help with uh, yes. and a lot of training, et cetera. It's, 
being, having that, com that conversation of value with a senior executive in your target organization is absolutely critical. Uh, and there's a process that I think, you know, we, we, we've talked to, you know, we, we, there's all sorts of training on how to ask questions and open questions versus closed questions and so on and so forth. Um, but let's keep it really simple. I think there's two steps to doing a discovery. And that's, in simple terms, I'll call them down the hole and up the hill. Okay. And down the hole is, is asking, first of all, what all the what is questions, you know? Any questions to do with physical, intellectual, emotion, whatever, the what is, what's the current situation? Uh, and, and really understanding that in some detail. And then the second part of down the hole is what caused that? Mm. You know, who, what, when, where, all those sort of questions. Mm. Uh, bring insight with those questions. So in another company, I saw the same issue was caused by this. Would it be caused that because the same sort of way in your organization or is it something different? Right? Yes. Okay. And, and now you're getting a customer sitting back saying, Oh, this guy really does understand our mm. business. Okay. And our industry. Yes. Right. But it, and so you get the customer opening up and you really, when I say down the hole, down and dirty in the hole with the customer, roll the sleeves up mm. and really understand the situation to the nth degree and never responding with or, or talking about a product or a feature or a function yeah. at all. Even when the customer says, oh, we really do have that challenge. That's a major challenge for us. And you're sitting there saying our product just blows that away. Right. Well, yeah, it's going to be on the tip of our tongue, isn't it? Yeah. No, not at this stage. <laughs> so this is, John, then, like when you're walking around a factory, when you're in the manufacturing space, you're talking to the manufacturing manager about improving production uh, productivity or reducing waste in the factory or reducing inventory and how is he managing that? How is he managing this? You know, what's that costing you? And, and so forth, right? You're really building out, you're really getting down in that hole uh, with the customer. Yeah. Uh, and you're not helping when the solutions at this stage is down yep. the hole. You're not sure. taking them on a thinking journey. You're not looking at a different way of doing it. We're yep. really understanding that and what problems it's causing. And, and you, you just mentioned a few there, but the, one of the critical ones, uh, you know, the old just-in-time manufacturing. Back in those days, you had queues of work of four, five, six days sitting in front of every workstation and subject to how something was manufactured and assembled and to end product, mm -hmm. it could take three months, four months to get through the factory. And now when you've got a customer saying, hey, we want to change in product and we want to bring a new product to the market because the competitors are doing something. Right. Design through and drive it through the factory can take six, eight months and you're not responding to the market. Okay. Right? So let's look at all the issues here, right? The cues mm -hmm. and what's causing the cues and what if. Uh, and, and then now, once you really understand the situation, you can start taking them up the hill. So what if we're able to reduce all those cues to about 25%? What mm. impact will that have on the time you get a product from the way to go through the factory? Well, wow. it'd be a quarter of the time. So what impact would that have on your customer satisfaction? What wow. impact that would that have, have on your competitiveness, getting products out the market much more quickly as the demands are, are seen and as, yep. as your food dust come through? Wow, that would make an enormous difference. The side benefit is the QZ much shorter and the inventory sitting in the factory would be 25% as well. So the investment in stock is much lower. Yeah. Right. But now the what ifs, right? And we saw somebody address this by doing this and this and this. And, we, and somebody else in, in the UK did it by doing this way. Right. And this is the challenges they faced and how they overcame came them. Now you take them through a thinking journey of a new way to think about the way they're managing their business. Mm. So down the hill, hole was the first thing. Up the hill is all the why questions and why not questions and what if questions and all the stories that go with that. Mm. Storytelling is critical at this stage. Okay. Can you tell us a bit more about that, John, just quickly on, on storytelling and how powerful that is? I, I, have, you, have you had a chat with uh, Mike Adams? Oh, yeah, yeah, he's fantastic on this. Absolutely, Absolutely fantastic. So, yeah. so having all your two or three minute stories ready, and this, this is something that's got to be done at an enterprise level. It's very hard for salespeople to collate all these stories on their own. But yeah. having all those stories that help the customer through that thinking journey mm. to the outcome, to the outcomes you're, you're look, looking to help them with, is absolutely critical. So you need to build a, a story library. And yeah. Mike 
Mike Adams talks about that. Yeah, and it's not just case studies. It's sorry. It's not just case studies. It's not just facts and figures. It's done in a proper structured way, and uh, you know, people are just more open to to believing something if it's wrapped up in a story. Mike talks about a simple four step structure to a story. Uh, sure. And Mike would tell much better than I can, but you need yeah. to have that story. And, it, it, and the, the story is, it, it must be a story. Again, you're right. It's not facts yeah. and figures. It's not that somebody, somebody made a change and got this outcome. We need no. to understand how they made that change. Sure. What really prompted it? What was the real uh, blockage that it had? And what was that causing? What, what, imp what action did they take? What were the options they looked at? When they chose this option, what was the outcome? Yes. Uh, and you need to, it needs to be about people and you need to make those people the hero of your story. So too often I see salespeople making their company and themselves or one of their own people the hero of their stories. Mm. The heroes of their stories have to be their other customers, right? Sure. They made the change. Yes, we help them with a product or service. Of course. The customer made the change and this is what our potential customer wants to hear about. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's awesome, John. Gee, we, we, we covered a lot of ground there. Uh, you know, the different types of selling. We really dug into the disruptive selling and, and doing that in a professional way, you know, to bring value to customers. We got into your know, five steps on how companies could go and, you know, institutionalize this. And then uh, we just dug into discovery and storytelling. So I think a huge amount of value out of that. So, so John, anything you think we've missed or uh, anything else you'd like to touch on? I think the, the, the common question I get from sales executives is, hey, can you come in and train my sales guys on how to be disruptive sellers or how to be challenger type based sales guys? Uh, and my answer is yes, I can do that as part of an, a change program. This is not an easy process to go through. It's a very rewarding process for companies to go through and they, they can actually change their world considerably, their revenues flow and so on but it's they've got to go through the process we're talking about it's not a matter of me teaching salespeople how to go down the hole and up the hill and take the customer on a, sure. on a thinking journey if, if you haven't thought about what that really means for your customers yeah i think really good advice john yeah so many people have gone through a course done a couple of days learned something goes on the shelf if the company hasn't fundamentally embraced that that approach it's just not going to stick so i think really great advice so, John, really appreciate your time today, and I think everyone uh, would have got a lot out of that. Thanks very much. Thanks, Stephen. I've had a ball, and as, as usual, you've got me talking, and I think I, over, I talked over the top of it too much, but uh, <laughs> no I get excited worries. about this subject. It, it really does drive change in organisations, and, uh, and we really, I think we, we have to get people rethinking the way they sell um, to help them achieve the outcomes that they really are struggling with yeah no thanks again john really appreciate your work and uh, how you're nudging the industry in uh, the right direction so i uh, look forward to talking to you soon mate and uh thanks, thanks everyone Steve. for listening good well, on you really enjoyed it look forward to the next time no worries bye-bye